Hello everybody, welcome to Oscar Rusty Buckets. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and drop a like on this video. It only takes one second and makes a massive difference in how the video performs in the YouTube algorithm. It's hot takes, let's get into it. The OKC Thunder will win 50 plus games and a playoff series. Chet will be strongly considered for Rookie of the Year. Yeah, Rookie of the Year, he has a very real shot of winning that, especially because I do believe among all of the top rookies, uh, he will be the one with the most team success because I am a big believer in OKC and and them being like a 50 plus win team this year as this take says I should probably actually go ahead and make a main channel video about this instead of just talking about it constantly on my second channel I'm late but Tim Duncan is a center not a power forward this is one of those takes and really one of those conversations that I find a little arbitrary and unimportant the real reason why this is even a discussion is because of the whole Tim Duncan is the best power forward ever thing and and people want to, you know, label Kevin Garnett, for example, as the best power forward ever, which is, you know, fair enough to want that distinction, I suppose. But really, I feel like it's ultimately super arbitrary for a couple of reasons. First of all, really, the main point of saying Tim Duncan's the best power forward is that he is better than Kevin Garnett, you know, to most people. That's the point of that statement, that he's better than everybody else who's played that power forward position. But another reason why it's arbitrary is I think positions are arbitrary in at least the sense of the differentiating is that differentiating I, I you know every time I record one of these I realize I have no idea how to talk uh, but the difference between power forward and small forward the difference between shooting guard and point guard historically those differences have super mattered uh, in terms of categorizing and all that but I actually think that most of the applications of standards to those positions have been similar Silly. Really, there is guard forward and big man. And Tim Duncan is a big man. Kevin Garnett was a big man. But they, back in, you know, the 2000s, big men played both power forward and center. And I think the difference between the two is extremely arbitrary. It's really just a label. And for that reason, uh, I don't really care. But if I were someone who did care, I will say Tim Duncan played his best years at power forward. He played like half of his career at center and half of it at power forward. And out of Wake Forest, he was obviously a center and he only initially played power forward because of David Robinson. And often in crucial moments for the Spurs, they would ultimately go to a lineup with Tim Duncan at the center spot rather than the power forward spot, uh, especially back when they had Robert Ory, they would go to that lineup quite a bit. That said though, he played his best years. He played his most prominent years, the years where we were talking about him as the best player in the world, the years where he won two MVP awards. Those years, he was a power forward. And as far as I am concerned, what position the guy played when he was old as dirt does not alter my vision of him as a power forward. But that said, as far as I am concerned, you could uh, delineate everybody as big men, forwards, and guards. Uh, and back in the day, power forward was a big man. Now power forward's just a tall, small forward. All power forwards are Jeremy Grant. You cannot win a championship with Jason Tatum as your best playmaker. I gotta say, I don't really believe in this concept uh, necessarily of like, I realize this is ironic given the team that just won a title, uh, but I don't think you necessarily need some exceptional playmaker to make for a very good NBA offense. I do think the way that Tatum has been utilized kind of banks on him being that kind of playmaker, but that's not necessarily the way in which Jason Tatum should be utilized and that doesn't necessarily mean that he can't be technically the best playmaker on just a team full of guys who can play make. I think the problem is we predicate that specific duty so much on a singular player and we have such a like a heliocentric way of viewing the game but if you just made playmaking a team ordeal it doesn't matter nearly as much that Jason Tatum can't just dime everybody up all game. But unfortunately the way that Boston has a 
ran their offense, especially in crunch time, is they just say, Jason Tatum, you do all of the offense. And I think that's unfair to him. I think it's unfair to any player, really, uh, but especially someone like Tatum, who isn't the strongest playmaker in the world. I don't think uh, Tatum can't be the best playmaker on your team and win a championship, but I do think that Tatum can't be like in a Steve Nash role and win a championship, you know? And sometimes I feel like the Celtics are trying to get him to do that. And that's just not the player that he is. And it's not the player he ever will be. Um, but yeah, Jalen Brunson is all NBA next year. You know, that's within the realm of possibility. I think he could average like 28 a game for the entire year. And he's a New York Nick and I could see them winning 50 games. And you know, he's very, 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 very good. I'm a big Jalen Brunson fan. And in hindsight, it seems quite ridiculous that Dallas let him go for nothing. But you know, at the time I was criticizing the contract as were most people. Uh, and we were all wrong. So, you know, good on you, New York, as much as it pains me to admit it. I don't even really have any valid reason to hate on the Knicks. It's just fun. I think if you were to replace Bosch with Melo on the Heat during the Big Three era, the Heat only win one ring, if any. That is a fair point of view in a way. Uh, the title of this video is going to be a less charitable uh, version of this point of view because it's a lot easier to fit into a title um, and more provocative. Uh, as for this argument in particular, doesn't necessarily make the point that Melo is a worse player than Chris Bosh, but ultimately the reason why I do for the most part agree with this take is that Chris Bosh's defense was so fundamental to Miami's success. Chris Bosh playing the center position was so pivotal to Miami's success, especially when pretty much every team in the East was like, you can go fuck yourself, Miami. We're not trading a center to your team. So they were like, fuck it. I guess we'll accidentally be a part of the evolution of the game and put Chris Bosh at center, an extremely versatile big man. And it just opened up everything for Miami and ultimately led to them being super successful. I think Chris Bosh's role on the Miami Heat is super unsung and super underappreciated, both for what it was in the context of that team, but also what it is in the context of NBA history at large. You know, Chris Bosh was a very, very pivotal part of that team, and he also was a big part of the evolution of big man. Uh, I'm not giving him sole credit. There's a lot of guys who are responsible, but with a player like him being eventually uh, a center rather than a power forward, that was kind of seeing that evolution take place. And Melo would be, you know, maybe the second option towards the end of the years because Dwayne Wade was playing on one knee, but at least initially, and at least for basically one of those championships, Melo would not be a top option, which if you're making Carmelo Anthony not a top scoring option, you're kind of just inherently limiting his game. I know there's like Olympic Melo and all of that, but I just don't know that uh, he can do enough in the all around department to properly be the third guy. He could definitely help them be a better offense, but I think the overall balance of the team, it would just be a little bit lacking. Carmelo Anthony was probably better than Chris Bosh for most of his career. That doesn't necessarily mean that he would fit better on the Heat. Fit and talent are not one and the same. Wemby is going to be the first ever rookie to win Defensive Player of the Year. This is something I talked about, uh, obviously, in my recent Defensive Player of the Year prediction video. If you want to go ahead and check that out if you have not already. I talked about the prospect of Wemby winning DPOY as a rookie, uh, and I even talked about whether or not that would make him the first ever to do it, and apparently, according to this comment, that is actually indeed the case, because, you know, why would I research on this channel? But yeah, Wemby has a chance. I, I definitely think he has a chance. I think he has a chance at All-NBA more realistically, uh, but nah, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna go with that one, you know? It's, it's a little bit of a stretch. Even even if he does play that good defensively, the Spurs probably won't be good enough to get the proper uh, attention and respect to that defense. Oftentimes, Defensive Player of the Year goes to someone on a 50-plus win team, and the Spurs are not going to be that. Trey Young has become the most disrespected star in the NBA and is starting to become criminally underrated. Yeah, here's the thing. I, I, I think he is disrespected, and I think that's just mostly because people don't like him. And I do believe to a lot of people he's underrated, but I also believe with so many people he's overrated. Like, there's just a certain crowd. I guess it's really just his fans, and I can't get mad at fans for overrating, I guess. But there are people who talk about him in a way that I'm like, all 
right, all right, buddy, chill out. Like I saw someone say that Luca and him are on the same tier. Come on, let's let's be honest with ourselves here. That's just not true. That said, uh, there are very few six two or below offensive players who have ever been as unbelievable as a creator uh, as Trey Young is, and as capable of scoring high volume points on high efficiency that Trey is. His playmaking stands out as even more impressive than all of that. I know a lot of people clown on Trey when he said that they, they gave him shit because like he said Curry wasn't his inspiration, Steve Nash is. I think that's actually apt and I think that actually shows in how he plays but so many people just only know Trey for the deep three pointers and it's silly. Uh, he's a generational playmaker who deserves more credit for that and as a whole, yeah, I, I would agree that he is underrated. I just don't know if he's like, you know, criminally so, but definitely underrated. But yeah, that is it. Shout out to Rudy for editing this video and goodbye.